Most dogs have something in common. They like to chase cars. Another thing they have in common, they never catch them. Just what would a dog do with a car if he caught it? Now, people also chase cars. That is, goals, wants, dreams. And there's some we don't catch, and it's best that we don't. There are some we catch that gives us problems. And there are some we catch and we find happiness and satisfaction. The children of Israel had been pursuing a good goal entering the promised land. It was a goal that God had given them. In Numbers 13 and 14, we have a description of what happened when the Israelites caught their car. What happened when it came time for them to enter the promised land? I believe we can learn some important lessons from what the Israelites did at the edge of the promised land. We have first the account of, is, of the Israelites at the edge of the Promised Land. The setting is their camp at Kadesh, Barnea, and the Megad. This place would support their camp while providing a good attack point. They were now close to Canaan, the Promised Land. God instructs spies to be sent out. There is to be one spy from each tribe. Those are listed in chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. We have the list of names. There are only two names that stand out in that list, Joshua and Caleb. The spies are to see what the land is like, verses 17 through 20. They are to see if it is a productive land. Is the land good or bad, bad or lean? Are there trees? The spies are also to check out the military strength of Canaan. Are the people strong or weak, few or many? Are the cities fortified or are they just like camps? And they're even told to bring back some fruit. It was the season for the first ripe figs, we read. Bring back some fruit. And so the spy mission is carried out, verses 21 through 24 of chapter 13. They go into the land, they encompass the whole land, looking things over. And they return and give their report. And so they say, well, we've got some good news and we've got some bad news. Well, they showed the fruit. Verse 26. And I always have this memory, I guess, from back in Bible class days and a drawing in one of the Bible class books of these two men. They had this big branch or whatever it was. And hanging from that is this large cluster of grapes. Big. And that's a pretty accurate representation of what is described in Scripture. And so, they said, it is a good land. It does flow with milk and honey, verse 27. But notice verse 28. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. They said, but, and it was a big B-U-T. Yes, it's a good land, but the people there are strong. Their cities are fortified and large. Well, this is the report from some of the spies, the majority report, it's been called. But verse 30, we read these words about Caleb. Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. The ten spies said, We are not able. They gave a bad report, verse 32. Again, and they give this bad report, it spreads out among the Israelites. The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. So the majority said, no, we can't take the land. We're not able to do so. Well, what was the reaction of the people? We come to chapter 14. Verse 1 says, the night, that night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. 
Verse 2, they did what the Israelites all, often did. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Talk about rebellion. They grumble, they rebel. They're all ready to go back to Egypt. All oh, for the good old days. How soon they have forgotten that they spent hundreds of years in slavery. It was not the good old days. Well, at that, Moses and Aaron fall on their faces, verse 5. We notice Joshua and Caleb, verses 6 through 9, and what they have to say. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephthah, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes. That was a sign of distress, of grief. They said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we pass through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, the land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us, do not be afraid of them. Now what an interesting picture that is. Let us suppose that the spies, ten spies were accurate in that the people in the land were a strong people. But Joshua and Caleb said, no problem. You just ignore all those uh, bomber planes and all those tanks and all that army. You just ignore that large army because God is with us. We have already won this if God wants us to win this. God is with us. How important a statement that is. Well, what is the reaction of the Israelites to that? Verse 10. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. What do you do when you don't like what the messenger says? You remove the source. It's been called shooting the messenger. What is God's response to the people's attitude? He is greatly displeased. He is ready to destroy them. Verse 11 and 12. Moses pleads for the people. Verses 13 through 19. He says, pardon the people. Well, God does pardon the people. But they will be punished. They will pay a price for their lack of faith. No adults will enter the promised land except for two, Joshua and Caleb, the two spies that gave the good report. They believed the land could be taken. They had faith in the Lord. Well, the Israelites are going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. It's going to be one year for each day the spies are in the land. The adults will die in the wilderness. Their children will enter the promised land. The ten spies who gave the bad report died by a plague, verse 37. Well, then the people mourned greatly. They had fumbled the ball. And we have an interesting turn of events. They tried to take the promised land. When God said they could, the Israelites said we can't. When God said they couldn't. They said, we can. The children of Israel were indeed very much like children. Verses 41 and 42, Moses warned them, don't do it. Moses said, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. Do not go up because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites will face you there. Because you have turned away from the Lord, he will not be with you, and you will fall by the sword. The Lord will not be with you. 
What is going to make the difference in the Israelites and their conquest of Canaan? Their victory, 40 years later, will be because the Lord is with them. On this occasion, God is no longer with them. They have rejected his will. He's already announced that the adults are not going to enter the promised land. The Israelites attempt to take the land anyway, and they are defeated. God had promised the Israelites a land flowing with milk and honey. At the edge of the promised land, they got cold feet. They seemed to forget that God was with them. And then when God said they couldn't enter, they attempted to take the land without God's help. This is a very interesting story. But how does it apply to us? Many times, we face the prospect of entering the promised land. Great rewards lie ahead. Often, we don't enter the promised land. We view ourselves as grasshoppers, the challenges of the giants. We may assume that we are all alone. We forget that God is with us. We're somewhat like the dog who chases cars. We pursue our promised land, but when we get to the edge of it, we don't know what to do. We become fearful. We become afraid to enter. We need to examine our goals. If our goals are wrong or not the best, we should not pursue them. But if the goal is right, if we believe God wants us to pursue the goal, we shouldn't stop at the edge of the promised land. What are some of the giants we face? A big one is evangelizing the world. Someone did some figuring a few years back. The principle still applies. They said if all the unsaved people were to line up single file at your door, the line would reach around the world over 30 times. To make matters worse, the line would grow by 20 miles each day. If you were to drive at 50 miles an hour for 10 hours a day, it would take you four years and 40 days to get to the end of the line of lost souls. And by then, it would have grown by 30,000 miles. Well, the task of evangelism does seem like a giant, doesn't it? But we know God wants us to evangelize. If we do, the rewards are great. Souls are saved. Jesus gave a command. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. But he also gave a promise. I am with you always. The task is huge, but God is on the side of the evangelist. We will take the gospel to the world when we decide to make the great the effort. There are some places in our world that are very hungry for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've been amazed at the work of Eastern Europe, European Mission. It was kind of interesting while we were at the Harding Lectureship. We had some downtime. We were sitting there a little bit across the way. There was a young lady speaking, and she obviously did not have an Arkansas accent. You could tell she was from somewhere across the pond. And she was talking to the two fellows, and I think I finally picked it up. Okay, she is from Ukraine. About that time, a little later, Tommy South comes down to join us. We're going to eat supper together. <clears throat> and he has made several trips to Ukraine. We'll be making another one in just a few days to go and teach there to help in the evangelization of that country. It turned out that this young lady's mother has been one of the translators for Tommy on his trips to Ukraine. He said, in fact, she's my favorite translator. I hope nobody, I hope his other translators don't hear this. But anyway, small world, isn't it? What a great opportunity we have to take the gospel to those places where people are so hungry for it. Africa, India, the Ukraine. We get discouraged sometimes. It seems that in our own backyard, people aren't necessarily interested in the gospel. We still need to try to evangelize, but let us look out where the fields are white harvest. We consider the work of the church. 
evangelism as well as other faces of the work. We look out, we see a land flowing with milk and honey. We see an opportunity that offers great rewards. <clears throat> there's the saving of souls, there's church growth, there's helping the poor, there's the edification of members. <clears throat> but we also see the obstacles. And you know, we tend to concentrate on the negatives, don't we? We say, how can we grasshoppers overcome the giants? Sometimes we don't enter the promised land. What are some giants the church encounters in doing its work? We can't afford it. We're not big enough. It's never been done before. We tried that and it didn't work. It might not work. It can't be done. Listen to these examples of inventions and ideas which some people said couldn't be done, so they resisted the new. The first successful cast iron plow, invented in the United States in 1797, was rejected by New Jersey farmers under the theory that cast iron poisoned the land and stimulated the growth of weeds. An eloquent authority in the United States declared that the introduction of the railroad would require the building of many insane asylums since people will be driven mad with the terror at the sight of locomotives rushing across the country. In Germany, it was proven by experts that if trains went at the frightful speed of 15 miles an hour, blood would spurt from the travelers' noses and passengers would suffocate going through tunnels. Commodore Vanderbilt dismissed Westinghouse and his new air brakes for trains, stating, I have no time to waste on fools. Those who loaned Robert Fulton money for his steamboat project stipulated that their names be withheld for fear of ridicule if it were known they supported such a foolhardy project. In 1881, when the New York YMCA announced typing lessons for women, Vigorous protests were made on the grounds that the female constitution would break down under the strain. Men insisted that iron ships would not float, that they would damage more easily than wooden ships when grounding, that it would be difficult to preserve the iron bottom from rust, and that iron would deflect the compass. Joshua Coppersmith was arrested in Boston for trying to sell stock in the telephone. All well-informed people know that it is impossible to transmit the human voice over a wire, and the editor of the Springfield Republican refused an invitation to ride in an early automobile, claiming that it was incompatible with the dignity of his position. It couldn't be done. It's, there's giants. Can't be done. Spiritually. Yes, there are some things that just, just appear like giants, too strong for us. But the Lord is with us. As individuals, we confront giants. God would have us share our faith with those around us. But when we go next door to invite our neighbor to church, we feel like a grasshopper, and the neighbor looks like a giant. We must overcome the grasshopper complex. God wants us to give. We think of why we can. Jesus tells us to put the kingdom first. We put everything else first. To seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. How about moral purity? We may think, how can I be pure in such a wicked world? Even in the decision to become a Christian, some just see the giants. How can I live for Christ? It's just too hard to be a Christian. <clears throat> well, Jesus made our salvation possible, and he will help us live a life pleasing to him. Jesus helps us overcome the giants we encounter. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. <clears throat> we live in a world where many feel like grasshoppers. We see lots of giants, and there are many people who 
who never enter their promised land. Do we view ourselves as grasshoppers called to conquer a land of giants? We should not if we're doing God's will. You've heard the expression, God and one person make a majority. Well, really, that's not quite accurate. God makes a majority. If God says do it, we can do it. Tom Southall was a student at Colorado College. <clears throat> like many young men, he played football. Tom played well. That's not so unusual, except that Tom had only one arm. Tom could have said, I can't play football. The field is a land of giants. They all have two arms. But Tom didn't let that handicap stop him. We do not have to be grasshoppers afraid of the giants. We need to let God help us face the giants we face.